Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Koshi, and I'm going to be your host for today's roundtable. Before we start off the session, I would like to take you all through a, a very quick uh, audio check. I've just opened a poll to take your response, so please use your polling time now to share your feedback. And while we wait for the feedback, if for any reason you, you get locked out during the panel discussion, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Also, I would request all the attendees to keep your phone lines on mute during the panel discussion. Straight after the panel discussion, we have a, a QA session where you ask your voice questions. Now, if you have questions during the panel discussion, you, you could share it with us via the chat option. And uh, I shall share the questions to the panelists. We will start the round table in about one minute from now. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard this evening's roundtable on COVID-19's impact on customer behavior through insights and data analytics. My name is Justin Koshi, and I'm your host for today's roundtable. First and foremost, I hope you all are staying safe in this uh, difficult time. On behalf of the Enter DigiMeet team and our panelists today, I would like to thank you all for taking time out from your busy schedule and uh, joining us today. So let me give you a quick uh, outline on today's proceedings. Today's roundtable is for a duration of 60 minutes, which will be followed by a 20-minute QA session. Again, I request all our attendees to keep your phone lines on mute until the QA session begins. And feel free to chat with us if you have any questions during the panel discussion. Now, uh, without further delays, let me quickly introduce our eminent panelist members. Today's roundtable will be moderated by Mr. Kaushik Bhattacharjee, the Service Excellence Head of uh, Medcare Hospitals. Kaushikji comes with a 20 years of experience in service excellence encompassing hospitality, BPO, and healthcare sectors. In his tenure, he has worked with some of the finest brands like Taj Hotels, ITC Brands, Marriott, Meridian, Dell Computers. Currently, he's heading the Service Excellence Vertical of uh, Medcare Hospitals and Medcare Centers which is a premium segment of uh, DM Astor Healthcare Group. Prior to joining Medcare, he was heading the Service Excellence Vertical in Apollo Hospitals Enterprises Limited. He was uh, responsible for initiating the concept of Service Excellence in Apollo Hospitals and has many awards and a place to his name. He has been conferred with the Bharat Gaurav Award in 2017 by the Central Ministry for his significant contributions to patient experience in healthcare. Kaushikji, welcome to uh, today's show. Thank you so much. Next up, next up, we have Mr. Manish Bivara, the uh, EVP and Head Customer Service of SBI Cards and Payment Services. Manish is a digital enthusiast. Uh, with extensive experience across banking, financial services, insurance, and telecom. Now, through his career, he has guided varied teams engaged in operations, services, collections across a broad spectrum of industries like BFSI and, and telecom. He's been instrumental in establishing businesses and leading change across organizations like HDFC Bank, Vodafone Group, and uh, MetLife Insurance. He's currently heading customer service for SBI Card, the second largest card issuer in the country, and leading digital transformation across uh, customer experience. Among his uh, numerous accolades, he was uh, recently awarded the, the Gold Steve Award for Customer Service Excellence of the Year 2019 by the International Business Awards, and also the, the Golden Bridge Silver Customer Service Outstanding Performance of the Year 2019 by S. He holds a Master's in Business Administration from Faculty of Management at the University, Bachelor's of Engineering from Delhi College of Engineering. Welcome, Ishii. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Next up, we have uh, Mr. Sunil David, the Regional Director of IoT, AT&T India and Asian Region. Uh, Sunil Ji has 26 years of experience in the IT and telecom industry, and he's currently the Regional Director of IoT at AT&T India, and he's based out of Hyderabad. He's uh, responsible for building the IoT strategy for the India and ASEAN regions, and is currently working with various internal stakeholders to ensure successful execution, and is also working on, on building robust partner ecosystem for AT&T in the enter IoT value chain, and also 
uh, working on a number of marketing initiatives to help enhance the at and brand in the IoT space. In, in Feb 2020, Sunilji was uh, awarded the India's fastest growing leader of 2019-2020 at the 13th edition of Asian Business School and Social Forum. For two years in a row, September 2018 and September 2019, uh, Sunil was honored the eminent Do Remember Award at the Asian Business and Social Forum. Uh, Sunilji was also recommended and recognized by the World Marketing Congress in November 2017 as one of the top 50 influential digital marketing leaders across India. Uh, Sunil has spoken at a number of uh, industry forums on topics related to digital transformation, CX, cybersecurity, and IoT. He is also part of the NASCO Mentor Group, mentoring many young women tech entrepreneurs in emerging technologies like IoT and AI. Welcome to the panelists uh, and today's round table, Sunilji. Thank you, Abhishek. Pleasure to be part of this panel. Thanks. Next up, we have uh, Mr. Vertul Mittal, uh, a technology and innovation specialist. Uh, Mr. Vertul is a leading technology and innovation specialist and a seasoned digital transformation and automation leader. He has 14 years of strong global technology transformation experience in, in management consulting with uh, global, global capability centers with a, a understanding and deliver business operations and technology strategy solutions globally. He has delivered engagements for uh, Fortune 500 organizations such as IBM, Barclays, Coca-Cola, Kotak Mahindra Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, um, Standard Life Insurance, and, and Citibank. Mr. Melville, welcome to today's roundtable. Thank you, Abhishek. Next up, we have uh, Mr. Sukrat Ghosh, the Senior Manager for Marketing and Membership with uh, DSSI, the Tech of India. Sukrat is a seasoned uh, motivated management professional with core expertise in corporate marketing and communication and people practices. He brings over 10 years of experience in big industries like IT, ITS, not-for-profit, and media. He is an avid learner and has a keen interest in organization strategy encompassing business, marketing, and communications and, and people's practices. Sukrit has been recognized with various prestigious awards for introducing innovation and anchoring transformation activities thriving on change. He is currently working with the Data Security Council of India, handling their marketing and membership functions, and supporting work across uh, digital marketing alliances, events, communication, and membership services and growth. Prior to joining DSCI, he had a long sting with uh, DC Technology India, where he was a part of the MD's office. Welcome to the round table, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And uh, last and final, you, you myself, Justin Koshi, your host for today's session. Now that we already, without wasting much of time, I would request our respected moderator, Mr. Kaushik Bhattacharjee, to comment the panel discussion. Over to you, Mr. Bhattacharjee. Very good morning to all my panelists from India. Uh, welcome to this lovely platform. Uh, Nitin. First and foremost, a big thanks to you. Uh, you are a very thoughtful professional, and I have been associated with you for almost now three, four years, and you have always remained the head of this game and giving us this lovely platform to share our best practices so that each one of us can benefit from this session. Justin, what a nice way of motivating us and looking at our professional journey. So exciting, so nice and so charming. Thanks, Ritan, for making us look beautiful. <laughs> a big thanks to all my professional colleagues uh, who are a part of this platform for being a part. I was looking at the list, and I was congratulating Nitin for ensuring that he gets the best people in this platform. I think overall, if I add the total numbers of experience, I will lose the count of some. So it is a great, engaging platform. In today's world, there is a popular thingy that's happening in the corporate meetings, moving to the digital platform. CIOs could not do what technology could not do, COVID-19 did, in terms of making all of us into one digital platform. Now, having said this, 
The best part of this so-called digital meetings, you call it the Microsoft Teams, it has started in schools as well. You call it the WebEx of Cisco, or you call it the Zoom meetings. The best part is they start on time and they end on time, typically the Indigo way of working. And uh, I am Kaushik, and I'm going to be moderating this session in the most engaging way. And I will try to brand this session as exciting, uh, engaging, and I want to interact with each one of you so that we bring sense to, uh, to this entire discussion. Now, to be very honest with you, before we thought we come and bring this session, all of us had a mock run yesterday because we did not want to be a session just where all of us speak about what we have been doing. But we wanted this session to touch on some of the pressing issues that each one of us are going through in our specific job, in our specific industry that we work for. And let us see if we can draw some common threads and learn from each other. So having said that, uh, this is the true litmus test, obviously would be your feedback on this entire webinar. So my first question goes to my technology enthusiastic Sukrit. And Sukrit, I know in your current role, you do a lot of data analytics. Michael Dell once said, I believe in God and above God, if I believe in something, those are numbers. So my dear friend Sukrit, I want you, because you are watching on the market performance, you are giving us greater data insights, or you call it customer intelligence. So tell us quickly what this data has to say. Over to Sukrit. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik, uh, for that engaging uh, start, I would say, and great context setting. A very good morning to everyone in the audience and everybody in the panel. Uh, you have given me a tough task uh, to, to kind of summarize things within a short period of time. But marketing during this COVID-19 pandemic uh, has been one of the most debated or discussed topics across industries. Uh, the reason is obvious. Uh, being a cost center, marketing spends have probably shrunk owing to declining revenue. Not everywhere, though. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a notional value at, at some places, but yes, it is an industry, uh, uh, I would say, fundamental that is visible. Not to sound bookish, I would say that I am a firm believer of fund uh, marketing fundamentals that differentiate marketing efforts from the sales efforts. And please allow me some time to explain and, and share some of those which is directly impacting the customer experience. Uh, like you heard during the introduction, I work with the Data Security Council of India, which is a not-for-profit body set up by NASCOM and works extensively in the domain of cyber security, data protection, and privacy. Uh, as a team, we cater to one of the most busy functions as on date, which is the IT and that to the cyber security and data protection office. Now, these are the uh, two functions which have been impacted significantly with continuous threats evolving in the market. So at the same time, when my target audience is thoroughly busy, there is a tough task for the entire marketing team at DSEI to bring out quality, to bring out that element of niche that can, that can increase the overall customer experience. Uh, just before I go delve more into it, I just wanted to check if my audio is uh, clear enough for everyone. Uh, yes, yes, you are. Yes, okay. please go ahead. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So uh, we have, we have uh, so as an organization, as a team, what we have done is we have focused on a few critical elements, um, particularly during this COVID pandemic. Uh, just to give a quick background, uh, which are the numbers uh, that the ACI team has done more than 50 virtual connect sessions with this community. When I say community, it, uh, it caters to its uh, member base as well as an open community which is joining us for learning and, and thought sharing. And we have been able to successfully run 50 plus sessions uh, catering to the needs and requirements of this audience and got a very positive customer experience uh, feedback from that. The elements that uh, we focused on, I would just quickly summarize them. I know they may appear to be known facts, but there is a fact, uh, there is a, there is a uh, focus from the team to work on these elements with with due, uh, I would say, religious effort. The first element is the quality of content. In this scenario, the testing times have definitely created a lot of hiccups. But if your content is relevant, real, realistic, and to the most important part, credible, you won't see any, I would say, any dip. All our content have been 
focus around things that have been well researched, well talked about, and promoted in the best possible way without doing an overkill. We have different avenues, uh, be it social, be it email marketing, or even uh, another critical element is what Koshik also mentioned regarding timeliness. We adhere to timelines. For us, and I would say this is an industry statement, it should be applicable for everyone. Delay means decay. If we are not engaging with you in a prompt manner, we are going to go stale very soon. Be it membership services delivery, be it meeting customer expectations from online engagement, timing will always be the key. Then creating avenues of dialogue is the most important thing after this. If you are trying to do something as a monologue, then people will tend to miss out. People will tend to feel that they are getting left out. So it's very important that you create a scenario of dialogue with your engaged audience. Which will further fuel your engagement. Fourth, the, again, the element which Koshik did talk about, which is close to my heart, is the use of technology to analyze performance, productivity, and optimization. There are many MarTech tools out there. And, and I, I know as a marketer, many a times you will be pressed against the budgetary constraints that are there. Something very heavy. But actually, I would like to share this with you. Not everything is costly. It is not about cost every time. It is about how agile you are in optimizing the practices that are internal. Think through on what all you have as, as a task. Think through on what all avenues you can get. There are many in the world who are giving you either free trials or they are free tools all together. Use them. Use them judiciously to be on top of your game. Getting analytics to actually understanding them is going to be critical. There are many things which will come as an analytics. But you yourself as a custodian of a brand, custodian of an engagement uh, flag bearer, you need to go deep into the analytics to understand what these analytics stand for. You should trust your partners. When I say partners, there are agencies, there are uh, tools which are giving you all those data. But you have to be hands-on with those data elements yourself. To go deep into it, to understand where a certain tweak can make a huge difference. Charts are good to see, but the real data is seen when you yourself invest time in those parameters. This, we have done almost everything that one can do being in a not-for-profit body. I have done it in the past being in an MNC. But if I summarize it, which in due to in, with, the, with the time frame that I need to see, I would say be agile and change with time to understand what the requirements are coming from the market, reading those analytics, and act on them on a proactive manner rather than a reactive manner. Okay. That will be it from my end on this particular theme. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sukrit. Uh, that was really engaging. And uh, now I'm moving to something which ties entire India together. I'm moving to something uh, which today we cannot think of a world without telecom. I'm moving to Sunil Davidji, who comes with us with 26 years of experience in IT, telecom, and is currently the regional director for at and in India and Asia Pacific. But before I move, Sunilji, I just wanted to share two, three best practices and that will help you to tell us uh, what is that we are doing in India, what is that we are doing in the telecom industry uh, so that we engage with customers better. Uh, Etisalat, which is one of the leading uh, telecom service provider in UAE, during this pandemic times had done complete revamping of their basic hygiene processes. For example, today getting an Emirates ID is not mandatory before Make a telephone connection. Number two, they know because of this pandemic times, people want to speak to their family members. So they're offering free calling, free internet calling, as well as 2,000 minutes of calling free to India. And I'm saying this to you because I, being a customer, I'm hugely benefited by all of this. And that helps me to engage with the organization in a more meaningful way. And look at this. I'm speaking about Etisalab in this platform. So, Sunilji, uh, over to you. You are the expert. So, how is the telecom industry rethinking customer experience, rethink, rethinking the customer design? And because you deal with B2B and you deal with B2C. So, over to you. So, thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. And uh, good morning to the uh, panelists and to the virtual audience. And I would like to thank uh, Nitin and the DGB team for giving me the opportunity to be part of this wonderful platform. 
So I think all of us have to acknowledge that uh, thanks to the telecom industry, uh, we have these robust mobile and broadband networks because of which we are able to work from home. And, um, and also the fact that we are able to collaborate and be part of this panel session, right? So uh, hats off to all the operators who really you know, worked really hard to make sure that the networks were very stable, uh, barring one or two glitches here and there, but I think uh, hats off to all of them. Now, when we talk about the uh, you know, telecom industry and uh, whether it's B2B or B2C, uh, there are three important points which I wanted to emphasize on uh, from a telecom service provider's perspective. Uh, the first and foremost thing in that uh, the need for being far more empathetic to customers, empathy, care, and concern. While this has always been important, this gets even more amplified going forward, right? So while there is pressure on the operators to ensure that you are able to maintain your revenues and gross sales, but the way we approach customers is going to be different now. We, we don't want to be sounding too sagey. We want to reach out to customers and support, but showing them the care and concern. I think that is fundamentally what needs to change even more going forward. Secondly, uh, this whole aspect of digital trust, right? Because a lot of the customers are coming online, new customer behavior is changing, their habits are changing. Many first-time buyers have come onto the internet. Many have not even transacted before on e-commerce. They are perhaps coming online now, right? So with a lot more use of digital channels uh, and with a lot more data being generated, right? And this is only going to get increased further, right? Because uh, with IoT, with a lot more consumer appliances, industrial appliances coming on to the internet, connecting to the internet, even this amount of data is going to get generated. So I think the onus is on us telecom providers to make sure that we are able to build that trust with the customer, saying that, you know, with all the data that we've generated, we'll make sure that we ensure privacy and security. I think that is also very, very important, this whole dimension of being able to build that trust with the customer. Uh, because if you lose trust with the customer, then you can easily switch brands, right? That's number two. Thirdly, uh, the whole need to make it very simple for customers, you know, to reduce friction, as they call it. Now, uh, telecom players are also morphing into what is called platform providers, right? Today, you are able to use, uh, you know, an app where you could not just, to, you know, uh, upgrade, downgrade your capacity that you want or increasing your plan capacity because you're using a lot more data, you perhaps want higher plans. Uh, but they're also turning into platforms where you can also transact, right? Uh, you could make payments and all that, right? So, so you want to make it easy for your customers. You make it seamless for the customers and the need for that omni-channel experience, right? Because as a customer, uh, they perhaps reach out to you through telephone. They might probably reach out on Twitter, multiple social media channels. You want to create that omni-channel experience where the data recipients silo. You want seamless integration. So that you get one integrated view. You don't want the customer calling three times to a call center or maybe, you know, so it makes it difficult for them. And even to transact makes it, you know, you want to make it easy. So reduce friction, make it easy to customers. So these three would apply to B2B as well as B2C. Now specifically with related, as it relates to B2B, uh, we've seen a lot of requests from coming from our B2B customers because most of those industries, be it manufacturing, banking, retail, are going through tough times, right? Now, there is, uh, you know, the need for telecom providers to be a little more flexible, you know, because we get requests saying that, hey, can you give me a little more time to pay my bill, you know, mm -hmm. or can you offer me some additional discounts, right? So, these are kind of requests that are coming, or I have a revenue obligation, can you maybe uh, defer it by one year, you know? So, the need is for the operators, the telecom industry to be a little more sensitive to those requirements and to, to be able to be flexible and you know, address some of those. You may not be able to address everything, but, uh, you know, the flexibility is needed. Secondly, we are also seeing from B2B perspective, companies are wanting solutions which are, you know, offered as a service because most of them are today constrained from a capex standpoint. Nobody wants to invest too much. Whatever solutions that they want, they want the cost to be reduced, efficiencies to be higher. So they're looking for the operators, the, the industry to innovate around the business models, the ability to offer you know, products as a service, uh, you know, bundled offers, you know, that will, you know, improve their overall uh, efficiency and all that stuff, right? So that is also the expectation for many of the uh, uh, customers that we serve. So from a B2B standpoint, these are different from, as you would expect from a B2C cost. Thank you. So thank you so much for engaging us and giving us two different concepts, B2B and B2C. I think I love one particular thing from your statement, the use of word empathy. 
I mean, yeah. there was a time when empathy was limited to hospitality, healthcare, and service industries. And but I think thank you so much for putting this as one of the core values even in the telecom industry. So Sunil ji, beautifully put across. Thank you so much. Okay, you. now let's move to a household name. When I was 18 years old, the first thing that I did is open the bank account, and the bank account got opened in with a lot of proud. It was like getting my first driving license. You have got an SBI account. So let me now welcome Monish ji, who is from SBI Card Division, Credit Card Division. I think he's the second largest provider of cards in India. So Monish ji, please tell us in this difficult times what are the specific challenges that you see in the financial sector and what are your plans for mitigating them? Uh, thanks, Karit. And uh, yes, the way IT said, the State Bank of India is not only a household name in uh, in India, but across all Indians across the globe. And uh, the pride in the tagline that we have, which is that we are bankers to the nation. And as bankers to the nation, obviously, it also puts in a, a lot of uh, weight on our shoulders. Uh, but you know, personally, I think I, I am a hopeless optimist. So uh, while you, we talk about challenges, I see uh, while there are definitely challenges, I think there are a lot of opportunities. And I would like to speak about more about the opportunities and the challenges that we have. Because I think the challenges that we have is something which uh, arises in the economy out of the pandemic. So every part of the economy is impacted by the pandemic because the demand is going to go, has gone down. Uh, it uh, probably will pick up in the shorter to the medium term, but at the moment, yes, things are down. Growth, particularly in the next two quarters, is going to be slow. Mm -hmm. And that is going to impact economy and obviously financial services, which is a key provider to the economy, will get impacted by it. Mm -hmm. uh, like Sunilji earlier said, you know, in terms of the ability of providers like us to be able to make sure that businesses don't collapse. It is important that we bridge the gap between the demand and the supply like we've been doing earlier. Right? So, uh, you know, uh, you don't really want to pull the rug from um, under businesses right now, which is why the government has taken a lot of initiatives in terms of uh, looking at moratoriums, in terms of changing the IBFC code to make sure that businesses which are genuinely impacted by the pandemic don't really go under because of this. And uh, I think this is where the challenge is going to be for all the economy in terms of the top line. And like it or not, when you talk about top line getting compressed, the impact comes on the bottom line and the, the real impact comes in terms of operational efficiencies and costing. So uh, while everybody may say that this is, a, this is a challenge, I think this is where the opportunity lies, you know, because this is where it is time for us to open up minds and do the blue sky thinking. Uh, gone are the ways of the way we operated earlier. We have to do newer things. We have to do things in a newer way. And uh, let, let me talk about it from a financial services perspective. Right? And more particularly in terms of the payment space that I directly represent. You know, uh, we've seen a lot of digital uptake in terms of sales and fulfillment as well as servicing. Over the last two years, I think from not, uh, since the, the baseline was very low, you may call it infinitesimal growth, but the fact is that it is still very, very, very small in terms of the overall contribution that digital sales or servicing does to the entire uh, you know, effort, which is where we see that a lot of people will now actively migrate to the digital platform. This means that there are opportunities for the digital platforms both in terms of sales, fulfillment, and servicing, to actually take a leap. Uh, yes, it's a threat for the physical platforms as well. Yes, they will have to re-evolve and re-engage and figure out newer ways of engaging with the customer. Uh, take a leap out of e-commerce, you know, and that is where so e-commerce is something that has changed the way, at least in India, the way people shop, and it, it's it's here to stay now. It's not going to change, and this is where. E-finance is probably going to be the next boom for us where people will willingly partake of what offerings we have. And when we talk about offerings, you know, about things like IVRs, 
the, the, the traditional IVR may be a thing of the past, you know, dialing a DTMF number and pressing one for this, two for this, four for this, is something which I think uh, was something which was on its way out. It is just that the pandemic is actually probably shoving it into the grave a bit earlier than what it was planned to. So we may see contextual and voice IVRs taking over in a shorter term rather than the longer term. You know, voice bots have always been there, but they've never really had taken um, had that uptake. This is the time when things and emerging technologies, uh, rather emerged technologies will find more adoption and people will willingly and sometimes forcibly migrate to these technologies. So the opportunities lie in those technologies in financial services and uh, in servicing per se to move people from the physical to the digital platform where people will willingly actually come out and say that with all the context of social distancing and the fact that you would want to avoid as much of physical contact as possible, this is a viable alternative which is already available. Which also means that those players in the market who are in this segment will actually need to evolve. They will have to evolve more. They will have to evolve faster because uh, it may just as well happen that businesses may start demanding the uh, digital platforms much more than they did earlier, which means that these guys will have to probably up their stakes and make sure that they are right there in the middle in the thick of things to be able to deliver that. So um, I think that is my two bits about more than challenges, the opportunities that are there in businesses to look forward uh, in the medium to short, longer term. Thanks, Vashish. Uh, Monishji, thank you so much. I think one key takeaway that I take from you is uh, how beautifully you have put it across. Change is the only one thing that is permanent. Because if you don't change with the changing times, you are bound to get washed away. India has seen multiple giants in the industry which got washed away because they could not change with the changing times. But I think COVID taught all of us a bright lesson is are we prepared? Are we changing quickly enough? Now, I want to invite Vatulji for this discussion in terms of how are we adopting to the customer different three different factors on customer experience during the COVID times. So over to uh, Vatulji for your thoughts. Thank you, Koshikji, uh, for the honor. And uh, it was great to hear from Sukrit, Sunil, and Monishji uh, about their, their thought process regarding how we are addressing these issues. So I'll, I'll keep it very crisp uh, for this question, where when you talk about the three factors which are adapting uh, to the customer experience during COVID-19 and how we prepare ourselves for the future, I think the, the very, core, very core to that is care. That is part one. Yeah. Uh -huh. part, part two is creative thinking and part three is new tools that we will use to address customers acute needs today and force stronger ties in the COVID-19 era. Uh, all well, I think someone... Uh, so the I guess is, some line is, uh, I think, yeah, I guess some line is not... I would request uh, every participant, everyone to please put your mics on mute, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we definitely do not want to lose the trust that Vatulji is bringing to the table. So, Vatulji, <laughs> thank please, you, everyone. Please thank go you ahead. Everyone. Uh, so, so, when we talk about care, creative thinking, and the new tools, so the most important element is in a short period of time when COVID 19 has overwhelmed lives and livelihoods around the globe. And for all the vulnerable individuals and customer teams that serve them, it has also forced a rethinking of what customer care means. The way we used to look at it four months back is dramatically different than what we do it today. And suddenly examinations of customer journeys, satisfaction metrics to inform what customers want have given way to acute urgency to address what they need. Particularly in times of crisis, a customer's interaction with a company can trigger an immediate and lingering effect on his or her sense of trust and loyalty. Now, as the millions uh, are already uh, furloughed, unfortunately, and retreat to into isolation, a primary barometer of their customer experience will be how the businesses 
they frequent and depend upon deliver experiences and services that meets their new needs not the existing ones with more empathy care and concern now is also the time for customer experience leaders to position themselves at the forefront of the longer term in consumer behavior that result from this crisis keeping a real time pulse on changing customer preferences and rapidly innovating to redesign the entire customer journey the value chain and how it matters is to a different context will be the key we can't uh, continue living with the same customer journey or same value that we had been having so to summarize it now when we talk hand in hand with this perspective four customer experiences practices can frame short term responses build resilience and prepare customer forward companies for success in the days after covid-19 so first one is we have to focus on fundamentals the entire care and connection for the customers for the employees for the community how well we are able to deliver it now there are there are multiple ways to it first is we reach out with support but not marketing secondly we take a priority of employees and community along with customers and third is we stay true to company purpose and values moving to part 2 of the framework is the how we meet our customers when where they are today so there are multiple ways to it whether we accelerate the digital options available to them by innovating digital models to help customers uh, during this crisis and they can actually meet their bau goals safely and securely second is how we bring more business to customer homes than they walking to us to our offices or to our branches how we expand the home delivery options and the third part to the second uh, pillar is how we make physical operations more touch free so considering contactless operations which is going to be the norm going onward like we see that already there are for example branches where we have zero uh, human being operator operators and people can go walk in they can deposit cash they can withdraw cash without any intervention third is how we reimagine the customer experience for a post covid 19 world by finding savings without sacrificing experience so it is very uh, economically hard to force cost cuts and when we migrate customers to digital channels to save money and boost satisfaction how we are able to do it secondly we have to reimagine our brick and mortar strategy because the erstwhile stores branches may look very different post crisis because no one wants to walk into them to for the customer query resolution and they want much more proactive support than a reactive support and last pillar is how do we build capabilities for a fast changing environment because it has to be more agile moving onward we can't have the same slas which with which we have been operating in past now having said this when we tap a social media uh, through surveys or quick customer readings we solicit employees for ear to the ground insights or we have a real time pulse on changing customer preferences through test and scale labs that is something we how we will adapt to agile capabilities for fluid times plus when we bring this agile adoption of innovation we have to pay more attention to failure modes and provide a effective analysis to that which will indicate that how we have missed any customer signal and we are back tracking it and ensuring we do not do it again so this is my submission on this on this point that these are the three factors care plus creative thinking and new tools which will help us prepare better to adapt to the customer experience and while we do it we have to focus on the fundamentals meet our customers uh, through digital adop- digital options and channels reimagine customer experience by finding more savings without compromising on the customer experience and the last one that how do we build capabilities to ensure that we can adopt 
and stick to a more agile innovation model. That's Thank all. You. Thank you so much, Bhatulji. That was very inspiring. And I think uh, that also tells us one very, very key important thing, which I loved about your messaging, is how do we bring our businesses at the doorsteps of our customers? Now, uh, I will start with my second round of thinking hat. But before that, I want to give a very, very typical example in healthcare, how things have started to change. When we were small, we did not have primary, secondary, tertiary, quarterly care hospitals. Dad used to call a doctor whom he used to know, and the doctor visit used to come at home, look at the patient and give medicine. And believe you me, today I think the world is moving there. Mm -hmm. uh, my personal experience, uh, although I had the customer experience vertical of this uh, group, but believe you me, from last two months, the only thing that I'm doing is I'm working with Cisco and launching the teleconsultation platform for Medcare. So at the end of the day, you rightly said, uh, I think for all of us as customer professionals, if we don't change with the changing times, I think we all will have no jobs. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, if, uh, again, moving back to telecom, telecom has always excited me, and uh, who else can give us more greater insights And Sunil David Ji. Uh, Sunil Ji, please help us to understand what are the specific initiatives taken by AT&T to enhance customer experience now, and how are you using data analytics to understand customer behaviors better and taking it forward? So Sunil Ji, over to you. Vaibhav, uh, sorry, I know you have a question. We will definitely come back to you at the end of the session. Thank you, Vaibhav, for your patience. Right, so, so Kaushik, uh, when you're talking about uh, the specific initiatives that we came up with, now, there are three stakeholders that we needed to address, right? So the first thing is the employees, secondly is of course the customers, and third is our partners. We don't call them vendors, we call them partners, right? So these are three stakeholders that we needed to address. Now, now from an employee standpoint, because our, our whole thinking is that if you are able to improve employee experience, that obviously has a direct impact on customer experience. So, so we need to make sure that our employees are productive throughout this last 90, 20, 90 to 120 days, uh, making sure that they are connected, constant communication from the leadership to every employee, uh, making sure that they follow the best practices as it connects to, as, as we connect to our applications, etc. So employee experience was, you know, obviously very, very important from our standpoint, you know, constant updates in terms of security best practices, because I'm sure you would have read enough of a lot of the cyber threats which increased over the last 90 days. Uh, so, so making sure that our employees are always updated in terms of the best cyber security practices and all that stuff. Right. So we wanted to make sure that from an employee experience perspective, they had all the tools, services that were needed to be able to respond to customer, uh, you know, uh, queries faster. Now, specifically, when it came to customers, uh, there are three important aspects that we had to look at from a customer standpoint. Right. So one is connectivity because customers needed to be always connected whether it is VPN connectivity or whether we're using internet or private networks, whatever. Second is collaboration. Uh, the need for them to collaborate within themselves as well as collaborate with their, uh, with their customers, with their partners. And third is security. So probably these are the three areas where we need to focus on. And what we did is we came up with unique COVID offers. You know, for example, on connectivity, we came up with offers where they could get uh, you know, um, you know, like 60 days of three minutes, for example, in the US, we are in the B2C space. Uh, you talked about how ATC Lab was offering that. So we came up with very good offers in the US where, you know, they could get free Wi-Fi calling, bundled minutes, you know, flat, uh, unlimited usage, just paying $15, they could get unlimited usage. So we came up with very interesting and very good offers around that connectivity. Uh, even for a B2C customer, When it's a contactless, you really don't want people coming installing something at your That was on the collaboration standpoint. Third is from a security standpoint. Again, there, you know, because we need to make sure that the customers are always protected and most of them working from home, uh, you know, we came up with offers where they could, you know, use a software based security gateway so that uh, the, the data is always protected. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, connecting to sites which has malicious software and all that stuff. So these are the three things that we did. Now, in terms of providing better customer support, uh, what we did is we set up, you know, while we have six command and control centers, we set up a virtual command center where they could actually uh, use, uh, we use a lot of automation, so we built a very powerful automation framework with using robotics, uh, robots, where customers could uh, connect to that virtual command center and get the support that was needed. Right? So, and plus, from a network disaster and recovery perspective, we invested almost $665 million over many years to make sure that the network is always been up and running. Now, see what we did. Now, we also wanted to, I also wanted to tell you that we, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, no, we, uh, we were far more flexible with the request from some of our customers, that many of them came to us saying that they wanted uh, better uh, you know, discounts and all that. And I can share an example of one specific customer that I deal with. They're, they're not a very big customer, uh, a small and medium enterprise, uh, and they were impacted badly because of COVID. And I'm just sharing this from my own personal experience. And they came to us saying that, hey, we've been impacted very badly, and uh, my revenue obligation is going to start from next month. Can you do something about it? Can you, you know, make sure that uh, I have six months where I can defer it? Uh, so, so it wasn't an easy request to take because uh, uh, hundreds of requests coming like this. But we managed to convince the top leadership that you know we had a genuine customer, uh, you know, customer who had this challenge. Can we do something about it? And we managed to address that uh, requirement of the customer. We were able to come up with a revised contract uh, where they could, they could defer the revenue obligation for about six to uh, six to seven months. Right, and I was personally involved in that, so that gave me a lot of satisfaction that I was able to address this particular customer requirement. And just last month, uh, you know, we signed a deal, a multi-million dollar deal with Salesforce. Uh, and uh, this is called Salesforce Customer 360. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, the need is for the omnichannel channel experience, right? The ability to integrate data from multiple silos, where you are able to have that unified view of the customer. And this becomes even more amount, all the more need for us to get that single view of every customer, you know, because we don't what point of contact we use. So now we have actually enhanced that relationship with Salesforce. We realize that the need is even more now. And uh, hopefully with this uh, new contract, that will help us, uh, you know, engage more closely with customers, give them what they want and what they need. And uh, hopefully that would enhance customer experience for them. Uh, Kaushik, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Bartulji. That was very engaging and I'm glad that the exceptions that you're trying to make keeping in mind during most difficult times. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think today one thing that's coming very, very strongly is the need for strategic agility in the organization, the time to change with the, with the changing environment. So uh, there were times uh, when market leaders, change was evident, change was happening, but the pace of change could wait. Today, the change can't wait. So I will take it to Sukrit. Uh, Sukrit, uh, what organizations can do to address the changing demands focused around customer expectations and behavior? So over to you, Sukrit. So uh, I will kind of draw inferences of whatever has been said so far. Uh, and, and probably the last point that was spoken about having a 360 degree connect with the customer. That is going to be important. And uh, in this situation where we are all in, Organizations need to be agile to the core. Uh, with the 360 kind of approach, you need to actually look at building communication, building those dialogue with your customers on a regular basis. Don't overdo it. Uh, so that's where automation will come in. That's where uh, account-based marketing will be prominently high. If you go, if you see the future of marketing from a B2B or even a B2C standpoint, I will just take a derivative of B2B into B2C for that touch point element where it is in line with an account based marketing concept. But you have to understand your customers a level deeper now. Because now with the changing scenario, there is an expectation from the market towards all the brands that they need to understand and, and relate with that empathy which was talked about earlier as well. So the demand will change. Uh, I would say you may see more of demand getting generated than before. But the revenue may not be, the revenue pipeline may not be that broad. So you'll have to come somewhere, means rely on, on, on trust, rely on, uh, to some extent, your gut feel that things will materialize into revenue eventually. And I'm a firm believer that if you provide quality, if you do it in a religious way, in a, in a, uh, I would say with, with confidence and integrity, 
it will come back to you so this is the time for brand for to to look at capturing the mind share and 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 changing their brand persona your organization can address the changing demands focus around customer expectations and behavior based is the kind of connect you create use technology that will be the bottom line because this is the time when technology will be at the forefront uh, already a lot has been talked about like what mr sunil also mentioned the collaboration is going to be the key and it's just not one industry which is affected it is the entire ecosystem which is affected and what one industry may not be facing right now may in, end up facing it if they don't take that proactive measure right, right away so agility at the core supported with proactive measures and collaboration will always have a i would say a sound future that's an assumption from our side right now because we are relying on some of the data facts they are yet to be means equated to real world revenue or or more money but at the same time that is how humanity has grown so if you look, if you look into a personal uh, as as a person as as a human being we place trust on each other when we try and support someone when we try and try and collaborate with someone many a times it has happened so the same thing needs to now translate into the business environment with covid 19 pandemic one thing has really surfaced and has surfaced in a positive manner is this power of collaboration this power of trust we are trusting each other today that we are safeguarding not only ourselves but this person next to us so that will always be pivotal even when business looks at its surrounding there are many small players who would require uh just okay i'm sorry there's a back to notification uh, so there are many businesses which would require support from larger businesses and that is what is going to take place in this next probably quarter or the next two quarters which would eventually lead to a sound future that's again an assumption uh, based on some data analytics but a belief more because i am a human being after all thank you so much and that was nice and encouraging uh, what will ji a uh, quick thing wanted to check with you uh, we look at trust for the computing we look at digital security we look at digital it control and i think all of this with, with all of this we need to rethink on customer experience during covid and post covid so what are your thoughts on it patil ji okay uh, kaushik ji very pertinent question in the current times so when we talk about the trust over the computing digital security and digital controls that we are trying to build uh, as a ring uh, ring fence across uh, all our customer experience operations so i have i have a different take on it uh, that takes us to a much much before uh, our entire operations have started and when we have thought about how to pursue them so uh, allow me a minute to take you back and in fact all of you back to a era when we as a human beings have basically always involved to a point where we can create better tools better systems better capabilities as a planet but we still struggle with some of the basics that's a there are a lot of buzzwords when we talk about all this uh, in terms of the tools digital and a lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding we very frequently commonly lose the use word digital we use the words transformation and then we use change a lot but i think that we are ultimately trying to achieve at the at the board and the executive level is a modern business strategy for a modern customer and market challenge with modern supporting technologies and capabilities so this is how we are trying to evolve now having said this when in the 90s we could write a strategy and it would last for 2 or 3 years in the early 2000s the strategy would probably last about 12 months only and if we are lucky at the moment the markets are changing rapidly if i put a strategy together last november in 2019 uh, probably it would not have included covid 19 and isolation so right so 
it would not have included bringing whole call centers or customer service centers out of buildings and moving them home so that would have been seen as almost impossible to do now but companies in retail in financial services in insurance and in credit are all still running their operations which are okay and they might be slower but they still work so with all these digital controls we have eventually moved our operations uh, to a different model to uh, where our customer experience agents or experts are working from i'll not say home but from anywhere and we look we need to look hard at our new business operating models so eventually we move forward but we lose market share market edge but we have to keep ourselves competitive in terms of that we do not lose the customer interest and as we come out of covid 19 and the isolation around the world there's a change window an opportunity to maintain a make maintain or make other great changes in our businesses plus our customers will be engaging with us differently in order to have a better services overall uh, customer satisfaction score and also how we make decisions in terms of that we try our best to traditionally the way we have bolted our it systems to the floor and we towered them to the sky but now moving onward we have to change them massively all our it digital controls mechanism plus we need to realize that the longer we have we leave something it doesn't get better there has to be a huge shift in terms of automation in terms of manufacturing or innovation that we have to bring to a larger customer uh, satisfaction customer experience because not every customer will be physically interacting with us they all will have be having a virtual touch point with us hope that answers but yeah absolutely attending yes absolutely and i think one thing which is which comes out of your this dialogue is lot of organizations need to rethink about their operational model few years back i could have thought it's not worth it it's not conventional others have tried it but today i think it is becoming a daily practice we need to better change otherwise we may get washed off now having said that i go back to the sbi man uh, munish ji please tell us some of the significant changes you foresee happening from here i'm sure one day will be a day when we will be covid free or we will learn to be with covid so munish ji over to your expert opinion please uh, absolutely yeah um... but you know i think what we've done is uh, we've actually hit the reset button and some people may act, may say that that's for the good especially the environmentalists because you know with all the pollution coming down especially my friends in metros would appreciate the fact that you can actually see the sky these days instead of the haze so uh, those things for the positive at the same time you know you will keep on talking about the new normal uh what i refer to this is as the new abnormal still yet you know because it is still as yet going to take time for people to come to terms and for things to settle down hopefully a uh, three to six months period but you're absolutely right things have changed they have changed for the consumer they have changed for the employee they have changed for the businesses and they changed for the government as well i'll i'll tell you why i say this uh consumers have started asking do i really need this uh, and in some cases probably also can i afford this uh, and that is going to be an increasing question i could already the manufacturers and marketers are asking uh, will the customer buy this or will i be able to sell this you know uh, the the age old question or does the customer need it was always a, a debatable question by uh, marketers but the fact is that these two questions tie in together because people's preferences will change and what this really means is the challenges for business would be businesses will have to do a blue sky thinking businesses have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what they been doing right and what they not been doing right in the past and what is it that the customer is going to look for in the future because uh, frankly Uh, as a consumer, even I don't know what the future is. Like what they rightly say, strategies are going down the drain uh, every hour, if not the minute. So, it is, if I don't know what I want, 
I really can't go out and tell you what I want. So it's like crystal ball gazing right now for the manufacturers and marketers to figure out uh, what is it that the customer really need. Uh, but a couple of things that are clearly going to happen is uh, increasing amount of non-human touch and increasing amount of non-human experience which will come in. Uh, and we've already seen that in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of technologies which have already been in place, whether in the contact center world or if you talk about the AI domain, you talk about the AR and VR technologies which are there in terms of experiential technologies, you can today, without walking into a store, uh, try out new designs, right? Sitting at home, you've got technologies that can tell you how you look in a particular hairstyle. You've got technologies that will tell you how a particular eyewear will look for you without actually walking into a store. So these technologies will actually be there at the forefront. What this really means is that I foresee that the role of intermediaries or frankly, who are the intermediaries will actually change. So the intermediaries today are people who are actually linking the businesses, the manufacturers to the consumer in a physical form, whether it's the retail business, whether it's the financial services or the services business, where we're talking about contact centers, uh, outsourcing, where we're talking about uh, logistics chains. Uh, this is going to change because the intermediaries today, it's going to be completely restart. The intermediaries of tomorrow are going to be the tech intermediaries, those people who have the tech solutions to link the customer to the consumer to the manufacturer. And that, that is going to be a big shift. And that is where, like I said earlier, there will be opportunities as well for people to come in. And uh, there will be opportunities for people to read. Uh, work from home, we've been talking about work from home, and I think uh, that is something which is here to stay. It was always a kind of a, a concept earlier, which everybody wanted to try, but nobody really did. And now that you've been forced into it, uh, you find that this is actually, it actually works. Uh, may not to the optimal, but it really works. And what it will actually give you is it, it is going to change. Uh, let me take this example. I think uh, I really like this example from work from home because what is really going to happen is uh, think about you as an individual. If you're not going to spend two hours a day, if you are in Gurgaon in Delhi, to commute to your office, what are you going to use those two hours for? You have that extra time for leisure, for your family, for entertainment, for health. So your preferences, so uh, it might as well, instead of spending that huge amount of money on buying a car, which you're not going to probably use, you will end up spending more money on probably a home gym or, or a home theater. Uh, I don't know, maybe Mr. Musk may want to change his uh, self-driving automobile plant and start making 100-inch LCD TVs because they'll be selling more in the future. Uh, maybe a... We saw Uber and Ola probably are going down right now, but given the fact that if I'm not going to invest in my own vehicle, uh, is it going to be a reset for them? They're going to come back with a vengeance. And secondly, if I do not, if I have all this time that I'm going to use in other alternatives, uh, is it going to actually benefit me in terms of health and well-being? And that is where I think it's, it's going to be a new era for us where people will start talking about Spending time with what they enjoy doing rather than earning livelihood because the time that they have at their disposal is going to increase uh, quite a bit. Well, and, and, and you may actually come back. You know, uh, I was just jesting uh, with Kashik earlier. You know, when we were discussing about this, uh, the dress code for this WebEx, and we realized, uh, you know, we may actually have to come up with a new clothing line for work from home. <laughs> I have still uh, stuck to the conventional clothing line, but maybe next time I'll think it to be different. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I think that is where we, we, we want to see how things are going. And uh, you know, th things are change, changing for the government and the regulator as well. So whether it is uh, Atman Nirbhar India, which is going to focus on self-reliance, or whether it is uh, the short or medium or whatever term you say of the, the Trump administration working on the H-1B visas, things are going to change and things are going to change uh, maybe in the short term for uh, challenging, but in the long term, I'm sure for the opportunity.
Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Manish ji. But uh, you know one thing which I I want to come back to you, uh, and this is a question which I think every Indian has got in his mind. I know today we are welcoming a digital platform. We are looking at uh, different ways of doing things. But is the country ready enough? Is the technology ready enough? Do we have bandwidth issues still? I mean to say, is the platform ready for us to take to the next level? So, Monish ji, uh, how do you rate technology uh, supporting this new era? This is not typically a question related to uh, SBI Mastercard, but your perspective as an individual, as a professional, and uh, over to you. No, you're absolutely right. I think while I've talked a whole lot about opportunities, the fact is that there are those roadblocks. Uh, and um, I realized this, I've had to get a second uh, Wi-Fi installed at home just so that I was able to get on to calls because the earlier one wasn't working. So you're absolutely right. Uh, the point is I think the technology is already there. It's just that the technology has to evolve and it has to evolve a lot faster uh, to cater to the newer requirements, which is where I go back. What are these newer requirements? Uh, I see that there, is, there are going to be fundamentally three technologies which are going to rule the roost going forward. The first technology is obviously what you are a part of, which is uh, the medical and the pharmaceutical business. I see, uh, you know, and fortunately or unfortunately, it's always been seen that technology has been at the forefront of the new world order every time there has been a crisis. Since the world wars, and uh, now with the pandemic, you know, it is technology which comes to the rescue, and that is where technology starts. And these are the inflection points where technology actually takes that huge exponential curve and grows because here is when the demand comes in. Otherwise, technology does not grow because uh, technology is expensive, and people have to invest in technology. It has to be commensurate. The spend has to be commensurate with that in terms of what they get. So the adoption has to be there. So it's like a virtuous, or you may call it a vicious cycle. But this cycle is actually going to get virtuous because the demand for this technology is going to increase. And if the demand increases, the investment is going to increase. The investment is going to increase, and it is going to evolve even more. So uh, technologies which are ready, which are there at the forefront in terms of medicine and pharmaceutical is something that I'm hunting on. The second technology that I'm really, really uh, keen about is those technologies which are to do with Enabling the last mile experience between the customer and the service provider. Now, it could be a physical service provider, it could be a um, financial services service provider. Those last mile interactions that people have, you know, today, if, even if you have to deliver something through uh, the e commerce, there is a last mile delivery that you have. A big pain point, and that is the biggest pain point that people have not been able to solve. Uh, I foresee technologies uh, will emerge. The technology is already there, so uh, I don't know whether you may call it the, the drone technology, which uh, Amazon uh, and everybody else is using in terms of delivery. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, machines are a bit more reliable than humans, right? They're faster, they're more agile, and they're more reliable than humans when it comes to that. So uh, the emerging technology in terms of fields of logistics, in areas of customer experience, like what was spoke about, we, we club all of them under the digital experience piece, but then speech to text technology has been there for ages, right? Uh, it evolved probably somewhere during the World War, right? In the First World War, uh, Second World War. But uh, it, has, it has actually reached a platform where uh, it's needed to grow. Because now, people, if you want to interact with a digital IVR, you need a speech to text, right? You need a voice bot to be enabled, to be able to understand those, not just those, 13 Indian languages, but the 35,000 Indian dialects, the tonalities, the sentiments, and it needs to understand as and mimic as close to a human being as possible for a human being to actually adopt that technology. So those are the second technology that I'll talk about. And the third technology that I am uh, very, very uh, going to go about is what I mentioned earlier, which is to do with those which are about personal leisure and lifestyle and well-being. So um, as I said, I foresee people uh, having a lot more time to do what they enjoy and then what they do to earn for a living. And given that this technology, whether it is in terms of streaming live content, whether it is in terms of creating live content, whether it is in terms of health and well-being, uh, is going to be the most emerging technology that we look at. Wonderful. 
and uh, thank and I, I love this coming from a banker. <laughs> thank you so much. Now, uh, while this is all very interesting, but I will draw a small little wire from a very personal experience, which I was moderating a session with hoteliers, and I was asking to one of the hotel CEO, saying that I know there's tremendous pressure because tourism has really impacted in a very very bad way. There's a tremendous pressure on the top line, and because of which, obviously, your bottom line gets impacted. We are sending people home. Uh, unfortunately, people are on forced vacation. Now he told me something which really touched my heart. He said, "You know what?" There is not always a war, but still we pay our soldiers, and my frontline people are my soldiers. I'm using this time extensively to train them, to engage with them, and to provide them platform where they can enhance my enhance their skill, which ultimately leads to superior customer engagement because we will have a world post COVID. What a thought! And with that, Sukrit, I move to you. uh how are um what do you think and how and this is not primarily to an organization that you're working for this is more generic do you think good organizations or great organizations can use this time to benefit the staff what are your views and i have to constrain you on time you only 4 minutes because i promised the audience that i want to end it on time so sukrit over to you thank you i would say i would say i don't even require 4 minutes for this because <laughs> the answer to this is very simple that yes this is the time like most of the uh, i would say thought leaders out there are thinking on the lines they are thinking on the right direction uh, in in terms of utilizing this time to reskill upskill cross skill their employees because at the time where you see there is a lot of turbulence at the bottom line there are people because you cannot control the psychology of people and to a large extent towards the bottom of the pyramid you will always see people getting driven by one thought without looking at the periphery of that thought and if there is a leakage it's just like a leakage on the and then the at the bottom of a bucket because of the g force the water will go out irrespective of how much you try to push it back so this is the time for organization to look at collaborating with technology providers for in the education side the ed tech industry is definitely looking up so this is a time when organizations big or small should look at collaboration to enhance the skill set of their employees at the same time they need to be cognizant of one fact that this is a time when people would be a lot more selfish because of the atrocities of the market they are concerned they are they are cautious as well as they are very much uh, vulnerable to 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 move out to a stable scenario stable environment which can cause brain drain within the organization but important that organizations need to showcase as of their market activity as well need to talk about it out loud in the market people are believing that if they're investing on people development then there is a need have a clear focus on my and a and a road map for collaborate with with organizations which can definitely uh, or by by getting your people and we are also getting that projection we're doing letting people individual self and the hard people can use this time get the self trained on new technologies and another revenue outside your environment which can impact you at a later point in time when the situation starts stabilizing and the market up okay a collaborated outlook to collaborations with at uh, building a culture of learn that is the more important thing with education culture very what people need to be taught by learning whatever we are doing and great you don't realize the importance of learning at that time so uh, sukrit a uh, great i i wish uh, someone from us in the forum can take this points to the board room where constant pressures are there on reviewing financial numbers and looking at how you can bring your cost down now uh, innovations and innovations are making very unusual connections today uh, what was told to be impossible improbable impractical but today it's happening i think a burning example of product level innovation that i saw in my career was the development of tata nano and thanks to the visionary mr ratan tata who dreamt of it 
created bottlenecks around the system and say, I want to develop a car that this price point. Now, my next question is to Sunil ji. And Sunil ji, this is not a, uh, a question specific to your industry, but what I would like to ask you, how do we partner with our customers? How do we partner with our, uh, in terms of employees? And how do we partner with our suppliers so that we build a product which is everybody's buying and we co-create them together so the buying is much more greater. So your thoughts on it, Sunil ji. Uh, sure, Kaushik, a very, very relevant question. Now, before I just answer that question, I just one point which I want to make, and we've been talking about this whole digital experiences because customers are using a lot more digital to collaborate with brands. I think what is very, very important is to blend the digital experience with the personal touch. Respect to what industry it is, I think that perfect blend is what is needed. Because I don't think anyone can give that superior customer experience only through digital. That blend is so important. That human touch is so important because when it comes talk about genuine care, creativity, this can only come from people. Right. So I think that point which I just wanted to make. Now coming to uh, this whole uh, dimension related to co-creation of products and solutions, I think the need is now more to get the customer as a stakeholder, right? Because Standard ways of building products and services for customers, that is going to change a lot. We need to get the customer involved. And I just wanted to give you examples of how we as a company have uh, been involved in, uh, in a lot of our projects. For example, we have what is called labs or foundries, where we get a customer who shares what their business problem is. We get the right partner who can solve the business problem. And we come up with the minimum viable product that can meet the basic customer needs. And once we build that, over a period of time, we fine tune that, but we are able to actually give our customer the product or service that he actually needs. So it could be, for example, we have labs in the healthcare space, uh, we build connected uh, uh, you know, uh, wheelchairs uh, out of a project that came out of that, uh, we build a smart class which will enable a blind person to you know, be able to navigate difficult surroundings. So a lot of the projects actually came out of those kind of uh, uh, centers where we got the customer involved, got the partner involved. And I think at the end of the day, uh, Kaushik, you know, when you talk about customer-centered innovation, where we're trying to get the collective wisdom of everybody together to build a product and service for a customer, what the customer actually wants is the outcome, right? They don't worry about the product or the feature. They want the product to deliver a specific outcome. And I think you'll probably see models going forward where customers actually pay based on outcomes rather than actually paying for a product or a service, right? So I think this is going to be a very, very important dimension going forward. Any industry, whether it's telecom or manufacturing, I think it's important to get the, and, and even from a, B, I mean, maybe from a B2B standpoint, but even from a B2C standpoint, I'm sure brands who want to be, be, deliver superior customer experiences will perhaps get a lot more input from their end customers so that they're able to build that product or service that really meets their need. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you so much. And like the pilot, I will announce the landing of our flight because we should ideally complete this by 11.30. But before that, how can I leave asking a very, very important question that's running on my mind to Vatulji? Uh, retail banking is going to be different and there could be new ways of looking at customer experience. Uh, Vatulji, your thoughts about it? And that could be the last question from my end. So Vatulji, over to you. Thank you, Kaushik. Uh, and answer that. So when we look at retail banking or let's say any B2C, uh, which we want to reimagine and how it will have a new way of looking towards a customer experience post COVID-19, I have two points to cover. First is how COVID-19 will accelerate the shift from face-to-face -face interaction towards the omni-channel digital communications. That is the first and most important point. So uh, for all of uh, us uh, who we uh, are on the call, there is no big surprise that Adobe just reported a massive 33% increase in demand for its e-commerce products since the COVID-19 outbreak started. So purchasing online rather than in shops will uh, hasten the demise of the high tree as we know it. But enterprises had better invest in best-in-class Amazon-like digital tools, consumers, are no longer tolerant of poor digital performance. So a third of all consumers will desert their suppliers after just one substandard digital customer experience. Second part to visit, we are going to have deeper and more emotional 
personalized engagements with our customers or vendors so now when we make a move to digital channels uh, which are more easily identifiable and trackable from the data streams we leave behind plus gdpr and the device of cookies make things a tad more difficult but this is to the advantage for our preferred brands who can invest and augment our first party data retail banks as a whole will enhance customer engagements using emotion detection and management to influence customer interactions plus emotion tech is real and it is going to happen which is with the with the rise of ethical ai and in summary uh, kaushik ji covid 19 will speed the mo uh, move of digital omni channel experience mm -hmm. to profoundly impact our relationships and behaviors at work and with our customers so for these two points first the shift from face to face interaction towards mm -hmm. omni channel digital communication and second we need to have more deeper and more emotional personalized engagements with our customers will actually shape up the post covid 19 uh, reimagined retail banking or b2c uh, model b2c models whether it's a banking or it's a retail for uh, consumer goods or anything else wonderful i think uh, what an engaging session i had with both Mon you know monish ji seal sukrit ji and vatul ji very very engaging now if i really have to wind up in one line about everything that we have been discussing and i can pick up four key themes one of the strongest theme that comes across today is strategic agility your ability to change with the changing times second now we have to look at newer ways of looking at things what we earlier ignored we have to tremendously focus on employee engagement because this is a time your employees might get disengaged because the face time is completely missing and the fourth important thing is we have to keep in mind that there has to be a world after covid where either we live we learn to live with it or we learn to have pre covid and how much we will depend on technology in terms of taking it forward so i want to keep it short because i want the audience to ask us a few pressing questions that they have in their mind so justin uh, i know you have been anxiously waiting and typically like the indigo way it's 11:29 by my sorry this is the dubai time so uh, it's by watch and i think we are one minute before time to our landing landing time so thank you so much it was pleasure interacting so justin over to you uh, i keep the floor for questions thank you so much kaushik ji uh, respectful panelist members thank you for the wonderful and insightful session and i would like to thank all our attendees for cooperating with us now uh, as uh, a more rate mention it's time for the qa session to begin attendees you can click on the raise hand option to ask a voice question and wait for your turn we would request you to mute your line after asking the question to avoid any sort of uh, to confuse your static you could also share your questions to us um, using the chat panel I think Justin, there was a question which I addressed a couple of minutes back to Weber. Right. I was actually just about to read it out to. Um, so one of our attendees, Weber, was asked a few questions. Number one is due to COVID, what do you think uh, about the retail industry and its survival? The second question is short is uh, how analytics will play a, a, a role, or technology will help to revamp the sector. He's also got questions on. and how technology will revamp the sector where it will be uh, analytics and or any digital platform as the sector is getting hit due to covid-19 and think operations where customers personally how to generate trust and uh, where whether be any industry particularly uh, fmcg uh, or its resale so we've actually touched this a uh, few areas but um, to ji and the other panelists if you could consider this question 
ask me, uh, panel members, would you love to take it forward? Because I think few of things have been covered, but I'm sure Baba has few things still un unanswered. So, Vakulji, do you like to take this? Yes, yeah, sure. Sure, Kaushalji. Hmm. So, I'll, uh, I'll take the portion that Deva was first, that how analytics and uh, how technology will revamp the sector, uh, whether it is a, a automation or analytics. So, Weber, uh, I, my answer to that is, see, all the industries which we talk about, uh, where we wanted to implement automation, or let's, say, or, or let's say analytics. So, there has been a significant change pre COVID 19 and post COVID 19. For example, uh, I'll tell you that requirement of uh, on site talent was not uh, was a key criteria when we were going for projects or engagement before COVID 19. But now, work from anywhere has become a new normal. So, the faster talent availability, irrespective of their location, whether tier one or tier four uh, city in any country, is not a challenge and we can get talent and we can onboard them much faster. Plus, there was a heavy re reliance on interpersonal interaction pre-COVID. Now, with the advanced use of remote communication platforms for zero touch engagement, we do not need interpersonal face-to-face -face interaction. Everything has been taken care of by all the remote working, remote assessment platforms. So another level of automation has become a part of our day-to-day -day life. Third is remote working was viewed as a flexibility option four months back. But now it is not a flexibility or a good to have option, but it is an imperative must have option. And people who cannot work remotely, they are only entertained to re come to operate from office with, with a, a good amount of social distancing. Now, another point to it is, see, uh, that I want to admit right now, pre-COVID-19, automation, advanced analytics were the talk of only boardroom meetings. They were only a part of strategy meetings or QBRs or HBRs. Uh, uh, QBR means quarterly business reviews or half yearly business reviews. But now, it is no more a part of the talk of the meetings only, but the entire increased virtual agents deployment and AI plus analytics powered service desk in a customer services operations and how we monitor their performance has become a core role of the entire new tech led operating model. So this has reduced the deployment of transformation plus it has accelerated the adoption of automation and analytics irrespective of any industry you talk about. So, I hope I have uh, answered the bottom uh, question. What you? Yeah, he's, uh, Viber was also requesting uh, an option uh, to yeah. ask a voice question to. Yeah, please. I'm just going to quickly unmute his line. Viber, you're connected. Please go ahead and ask your question. Viber, can you hear us? You're on the bridge right now. Please go ahead and ask your question. I think Weber is again muted. Yeah, Weber, if you are unmute, can you please speak up? Okay, looks like we have a, an audio issue with Viper. I'm just going to put him back on mute and. Uh, We'll wait for other question to um, come through. Uh, just, uh, just on what Mr. Varto is an additional element which I just wanted to highlight. Am I, am I audible? Yes, sir, yes. Please, please, please go ahead. Go ahead please. Yeah. I'm just uh, closing my video, I guess, it's, uh, because my device is getting too hot. It is fluctuating. So just to just to mention one critical element why we are into the new normal, and and that is owing to my close proximity with the core theme of my organization, that is cyber security. This is the time when a lot of automation and a lot of virtualization will 
definitely be helping but at the same time we all need to be very cognizant means caution as well as we have to be cognizant of a lot of these uh, cyber security and data privacy elements because earlier with physical um, um, means meetups and 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 connect you were restricted to some of the data elements but now with the virtual connect you are actually vulnerable to giving access to a lot of your data elements which you may not choose to do when you meet people physically that is in person okay. so as an organization when we look at um, developing avenues of reaching out to the market engaging with them we need to be thorough with our approach uh, starting from the tools that we are using the kind of privacy policies which are there the kind of data that we capture and then how we process that data so there are elements uh, which are being discussed right now as part of the event the personal data protection bill 2019 which is right now in the parliament with the dpc so that review is going on so a lot of these organizations will have to look into that element as well when they try to reach out to the end customer because giving a good customer experience would require analytics and automation which like other panelists also mentioned at the same time the onus on the brand has increased significantly and it will go it will it will rise steeply as we add more data elements to kind of cater to and 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 then probably process them because being a data fiduciary also will have a lot of elements to look at so my my only um, word of caution would be that whatever we plan we should plan it in the purview of the data protection and the cyber security norms not because i am coming from that organization but because as a marketer also we have been acquainted with these facts long back when the gdpr uh, norms came into play so all the organizations are working in european markets they know how how stringent that is and what kind of penalties are associated with it so opt-ins and all that just elements but there are to be there are deep dive elements and as marketers or as business professionals we all need to be aware of all those elements before we go ahead and and do something as an out Right. Thank, thank you so much, Sukrit. I also have one quick question. Uh, if any of our uh, panelist members would like to take this, you know, how do you pursue or how do you channel your top management to cope up with the recent changes and how to kind of influence them to adopt new tech ideas and uh, go with their approach? This is again a so, question by Vibo. Vibo, I will give you from a healthcare perspective, and it's a very different perspective, but I always feel sometimes a different perspective helps. Um, what we started doing is obviously during the COVID times, uh, a pressing need was coming that a lot of patients were not able to come to us because of the fear factor was significantly very, very high. So what we started doing, we started calling all our patients in the disease who are enrolled with us in the disease management program. And we started delivering medicines at their doorstep we started engaging with them in the teleconsultation platform. And to do all of this, believe you me, you needed manpower. At the end of the day, calling every single customer, you needed manpower. So when we were presenting this concept to the leadership team where everybody's talking, revenues are not happening, we opened a separate channel, which is called the unconventional method of generating revenue. Today, three months post COVID, I can proudly tell you, I'm generating approximately 25 million from this channel. So to be very, very honest, even people sitting at the top, if we make a solid logic note and link it, how it's going to benefit the customer, benefit the community, at the end of the day, I think it will definitely solve the purpose. And because of which, we were able to give, no cuts were made in the salaries, we were able to give everybody their full salary. So I think that's a success that we created because the top management believed agreed, saw the vision together, and we made it happen. So that was my perspective. Other uh, team members, uh, you know, please feel free to express your thoughts. Totally agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. Good. From my perspective, I think it's very important for leadership to, to get that feedback from people who are closest to the customers. So, um, um, there are some, especially in a big organization, between the top and the people who are actually 
client facing there are a lot of layers in between i think the need is for them to look at ways by which people who are on the front line who are closer to the customers to make sure that that information feedback goes to the leadership cutting through those layers if there are new layers maybe they should look at trying to see how they can uh, you know kind of find ways by which they can uh, you know uh, make it a little more easier but uh, enough channel should be there for people to reach up to reach to leadership to make sure that feedback goes directly and uh, you know at the end of the day you know you want to provide solutions and services to what your customers want and uh, and hence i think the need for management to be a little more flexible uh, and uh, listen to the heart of the customer which comes from most of the people who are in the client facing roles thank you and, and just to, just to add a brief uh, here also data will play the bigger role how we process the data and showcase so the art of presentation will definitely play a role because the management team would like to run through all those data analytics in a way that it is easy to comprehend so probably only on 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 the presenters there to showcase the reality in in a i would say seamless manner right thank you thank you for the response so as mr bhattacharji i don't see any more questions coming through and i believe we could uh, conclude today's round table great i think uh, fine i uh, we don't have any questions i think definitely we can conclude uh, just uh, from my end i think uh, i enjoyed moderating this session because i personally learned a lot of things which i can imbibe in the business that i operate and uh, i think uh, we should engage with all of you know with the entire team in a, in a similar fashion so that we are able to learn from each other and a big big thanks to nitin for making this possible and i am anxiously waiting to have many more of them with many more audiences so that we can truly touch lives so that is all from my end thank you thank you thank you kaushik sir for moderating it so well and being a patient moderator thank you so much sir <laughs> thank you for your being part of this great thank you really great. enjoyed it thank you thank you Once again, respected panelist members and attendees, uh, on behalf of the entire Digimi team, I would like to thank you all for joining today's uh, session. Wishing you all a very pleasant day ahead, and look forward to having you on board in uh, one of our coming rounds. Thank you so much once again, and uh, please stay well.